You can also join in our discussion on FPA's Facebook page or in the live chat on our FPA 1918 YouTube channel. I'm pleased to welcome to this forum from his farm in New Hampshire, Joseph Nye, a preeminent authority on US foreign policy. Joe received his bachelor's degree summa cum laude from Princeton University, where he won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford. He earned a PhD in political science from Harvard. A former Dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, he is the Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus at Harvard. He has held senior government posts, including Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, Deputy Undersecretary of State, and Chair of the National Intelligence Council. He has authored many iconic books. Today, we will be discussing his most recent book, Do Morals Matter? Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump. The book has received much critical acclaim. Walter Isaacson, president, actually former president of the Aspen Institute, and a professor of history at Tulane writes, in times like these, it's important to appreciate the role that moral reasoning should play in foreign policy. This is especially true in a democracy where sustaining global involvement requires support from citizens. Joe Nye is one of our foremost and engaging analysts of American diplomacy. And in this book, he provides a clear-eyed <clears throat> guide for re-engaging our moral compass. David Gergen, CNN senior political analyst and founding director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard states, with characteristic insight and precision, Joseph Nye raises tough questions of how much ethics should shape a nation's foreign policy. He provides a sweeping review of how past presidents have embraced or rejected ethical imperatives and constructs a helpful scorecard for judging future presidents. And Margaret Macmillan, Emeritus Professor of International History at Oxford says, as Professor Nye shows convincingly in this highly readable book, leaders and citizens alike make assumptions, decisions, and judgments which reflect their own views about what is good and bad. Yet again, he has contributed much to our better understanding of international relations. And now let's hear from the author himself. Joe, I turn it over to you to make some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Noel, and I, I will keep my remarks brief because I look forward to the questions. But I must say that uh, when I told a friend at one point that I was writing a book on um, morals and foreign policy, she said, oh, well, that's good. It'll be a short book. And certainly the conventional wisdom uh, is that morals don't matter all that much, or another way of putting it is that uh, national interest is all that counts. And uh, then uh, in national interest basically bake the cake and then politicians come along and sprinkle a little morality on it like icing to make it look pretty, but uh, it's all baked in national interest. Indeed, when I was in the State Department, I remember uh, saying to a, uh, a French diplomat, we were working on some nuclear issues together. I said, boy, the what do you think are the moral implications of what we're deciding? He said, there is no morality for me except the interests of France. And uh, I don't know whether he realized what a profound moral judgment he had just made when he said that. But in any case, that is very often the way people look at this issue. And I wanted to do two things in the book. I wanted to first show that if you had that view of history, you are gonna get history wrong because in practice, looking at each of the 14 presidents we've had since 1945, uh, their moral views were really important ingredients, not just icing sprinkled on the cake. 
And then the second thing I wanted to do with the book was to say, okay, if morals matter, then how should we think about them? And I argued that we often think about them in somewhat shallow ways, that if you have good intentions or make good speeches, you have moral clarity. And my argument is that no, that's not enough. You have to not only have good intentions, you also have to use good means and have good consequences. Let me just give you an example, though, of, of a president, Harry Truman, uh, that illustrates why we have to take morals seriously. Many people have criticized Truman for dropping a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, they then say this was immoral. In some ways, Truman had little choice on that. He is the General Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, put it, he was like a boy on the back of a toboggan that was already running downhill. But it's interesting that Truman decided not to drop a third bomb, which was available. Uh, and he said the reason he didn't want to was he didn't want to kill any more women and children. But perhaps even more important, five years later, uh, when he was losing or there was a stalemate in the war in Korea, and he was told this is going to destroy your presidency. And uh, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur said, if you allow me to drop 25 to 40 atomic bombs on Chinese cities, I can win this war. And Truman said, no, uh, basically I'm not gonna kill that many more women and children. And think of the importance of that as Tom Schelling, the Nobel laureate said in his uh, acceptance address, the nuclear taboo in which nuclear weapons are not treated as normal weapons, but as for deterrence only, uh, that has been one of the most important things that's happened since 1945. Imagine that Truman had made that decision along MacArthur's lines differently, and nuclear weapons were today normal everyday weapons. Uh, the world would look very different. So that's a pretty dramatic example of where morals mattered, where the moral views of a president made a huge difference. So the cynics who say morals don't matter are gonna get history wrong. And then just to finish it up by saying that once you say that morals matter, then you have to avoid the simplistic type of views that if I have good intentions, uh, or have moral clarity in the way I express a freedom agenda that uh, I have a moral policy. And a good example of this would be George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003, in which uh, his press spokesman, Ari Fleischer, said, uh, uh, praised Bush for his moral clarity. Let's grant Bush good intentions but uh, he did not pay close attention to the means that were used. In fact, uh, he discarded many of the warning papers from the State Department and the intelligence community uh, about the difficulties of, the, of trying to democratize Iraq. Uh, and then he went ahead anyway, and he produced a situation in which we basically strengthened Al Qaeda in Iraq, which eventually uh, uh, transformed itself into the Islamic State with horrendous consequences. Uh, if this were a legal matter, we would say that Bush failed to do due diligence about the means, and he was guilty of culpable negligence for not looking carefully enough into the potential unintended consequences. So let's grant him good intentions, but what I argue in the book is a moral foreign policy has to look at all three dimensions of motives, means, and consequences, and then try to make a balanced judgment uh, before you try to say whether it's a moral or immoral policy. Uh, looking over the presidents, the 14 presidents, uh, the ones who come out best um, in, in the top tier of four, if you like, um, were Roosevelt, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, and the first President Bush, George H.W. Bush. Uh, the ones who brought up the bottom tier of four were uh, 
basically Lyndon Johnson because of uh, Vietnam, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, George W. Bush, largely because of Iraq, and uh, the incumbent, Donald Trump, though in fairness, uh, if I were grading him on an exam, I'd have to say he gets an incomplete, but he'll also get a note from the teacher saying need to do better. In any case, uh, that's the gist of what I've tried to get at in the book. There are lots of details and lots of arguments. It's not so much my judgments that uh, are important in the book, it's trying to provide a framework uh, about how to think about morality, particularly at a time when we're seeing it so deeply challenged as we are in the current days. So that's, uh, that's those are my opening thoughts and, and no, I'll turn it back to you and um, I'd be love to uh, have a conversation or get into a Q and A with, uh, with anybody that's listening. Well, thank you very much, Joe. And uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, let me exercise the uh, moderator's prerogative here and ask the first question. Um, in perhaps the most important speech delivered at the Foreign Policy Association, FDR uh, said before 1600 members of FPA uh, the following, uh, the power which this nation has attained, the political, the economic, the military, and above all the moral power has brought us to, has brought to us the responsibility and with it the opportunity for leadership in the community of nations. It is our own best interest and in the name of peace and humanity, this nation cannot, must not, and will not shirk that responsibility, end of quote. You state in your book that the disastrous decade of the 1930s was caused when the United States replaced Britain as the largest global power, but failed to take on Britain's role in providing global public goods. Are we entering into a similar period today with US retrenchment in the world, giving rise to a, a period, I guess it's been called an age of impunity? Well, I think there is something in that. Um, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected, uh, he focused primarily on the United States. He was invited to a, uh, an economic conference in London in 1933 to try to stabilize the world economy. Uh, he didn't go. And he basically was totally focused on domestic politics in the US. But by the time he got to 1944 uh, and realized how important it was to have an international framework of institutions uh, to guide the world order, uh, he established the Bretton Woods institutions, the monetary fund and the bank. And also of course in 45, left uh, the plans for the United Nations. And uh, so Roosevelt went through a real transformation in his own thinking that it's not enough just to think of your short-term self-interest. Uh, you have to define American national interest broadly as including the interests of others. And in 2016, when Donald Trump ran for president, he was the first president uh, since uh, 1945 who basically did not pay close attention or value American alliances and multilateral institutions. And we've seen that very much in the short-term transactional type of approach that he's taken to wins and losses. Another way of putting it is that Every president has to do America first. That's what he's elected for. The moral issue comes in to how broadly or narrowly do you define America's interest? Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and the others defined America's interest broadly to include the interests of others, providing global public goods. Uh, Trump has more or less defined these interests very narrowly, very transactional terms like 
real estate deals, I win, you lose. And uh, I think that has been bad for us, the United States, but also bad for the world. Thank you very much. Um, you refer repeatedly in your book to the importance of contextual intelligence, which you define as the ability to understand an evolving environment and capitalize on trends. How does a leader acquire contextual intelligence? Well, contextual intelligence um, comes in large part from experience. Uh, for example, the first President Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, not only served in World War II, but he also occupied a whole series of positions from the, uh, in, in the Congress, in the, uh, as an envoy to China, ambassador to the UN, head of the CIA. Bush came into office with extraordinary knowledge about what he was confronting. Similarly, Dwight Eisenhower had extraordinary in contextual intelligence from his experience in World War II. But just to contrast the two Bush presidencies, um, George W. Bush had very little contextual intelligence about international affairs. Uh, he had not traveled abroad much. And uh, basically, his experience of governor of Texas was not similar to his father's. Uh, interesting to me is that Barack Obama, who uh, was had pretty good contextual intelligence, but had not served in government before he uh, was uh, uh, in other than the Senate and the state legislature, um, nonetheless had the background of uh, an anthropologist mother, an African father, and having uh, lived abroad in Indonesia as a child. And that seems to have helped him on contextual intelligence. So you don't have to have occupied all the great offices of the realm to develop contextual intelligence. You do have to have intellectual curiosity about a variety of experiences. I'd like to come back to um, nuclear weapons. Uh, you say in the book, nuclear weapons raise crucial moral issues for presidents, and our history would look very different if the taboo against nuclear use had not held over the past seven decades. <clears throat> how, does, how does character um, intersect with, with uh, this awesome uh, weapon, and, and how should we as the electorate uh, judge uh, presidential candidates uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons? Well, I think we definitely want a president who is mature, does not engage in braggadocio about weapons, who understands their uh, potential uh, catastrophic effects if, if used, uh, but also realizes that they are important for deterrence. Um, the American nuclear um, umbrella is important from deterring China from uh, uh, basically uh, bullying Japan or from Russia from invading uh, the Baltic states and Eastern Europe. So nuclear weapons uh, are there, they're important, but they have to be handled with extreme care. Uh, you see this incidentally in Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who uh, knew a lot about the military and a lot about weapons. And in a period when the Americans had clear nuclear superiority, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff came to him and said, uh, what about using them to save the French at Dien Bien Phu in, in Indochina? And Eisenhower said, you boys must be crazy to want to use these against Asians again in 10 years. Or later, uh, the Joint Chiefs came to him and said, maybe we should have preemptor against uh, the Soviet Union before they become too strong. 
And Eisenhower's comment was, you know, think about it. After you've destroyed most of the world between Moscow and Vladivostok, what are you going to have in that smoking ruin? What, who is going to manage it? Who's going to control it? And what are you going to think about after you try to resurrect this place? So Eisenhower had, even though he often talked tough about nuclear weapons for deterrence purposes, uh, he had pretty good common sense and uh, very good character when it came to practical recommendations that were made to him by the military for their actual use. <clears throat> I uh, have to tell you the uh, experience we had at uh, the Foreign Policy Association when we jointly sponsored a conference with the Norwegian Nobel Institute on uh, nuclear uh, proliferation. And uh, we had left uh, the last panel uh, for, of young uh, academics for last, thinking they would end the conference on a hopeful note. And a gentleman from Dartmouth uh, ended the conference by saying that uh, nuclear weapons have saved more lives uh, than antibiotics. Um, I was flabbergasted, but uh, I'm just wondering how you feel about any possibility of um, eradication, uh, eradic eradication of uh, nuclear weapons and whether the efforts that uh, President Obama made uh, could ever uh, be resurrected uh, and uh, att attain fruition. Well, Obama said in his speech in Prague that he looked forward to a world without nuclear weapons, but he also said he didn't expect it in his lifetime. Um, with colleagues at, at Harvard, um, we had a project in the 1980s, which we called the Avoiding Nuclear War Project. And what we concluded there was that abolition of nuclear weapons was not likely in the short run. And it's not clear that the effort to abolish in the short run would be stabilizing. But what we said was you can get away from the prospect of nuclear use, even if you can uh, not get rid of nuclear weapons entirely. So uh, the, what we said, it's better to have your nuclear weapons well away from the front lines, uh, well away from the hair trigger or short term alerts and to engage in international frameworks such as arms control negotiations or the non-proliferation treaty, which make it less likely that they're going to be used. So the solution I think is to aim in a long run to a world where nuclear weapons have less importance. But uh, until we get to a world where it will be stabilizing, uh, we should not have illusions that just calling for abolition is going to make us all safer. And that's one of the hard uh, moral choices that a president faces about nuclear weapons. Uh, we should be trying to reduce their role. And I think that's what Obama was trying to do, but uh, too rapid an effort to reduce them if it led to greater instability could actually raise the probabilities of nuclear use. And after all, it's not the nuclear weapon, it's the nuclear use, which is the greatest evil. <clears throat> I uh, enjoyed very much your uh, uh, chapter on foreign policy and future choices. And uh, in it, you refer to uh, institutions, uh, you say institutions help to lengthen the shadow of the future that encourages reciprocity and cooperation. Um, how do, what, what is your um, appraisal for the future of uh, the United Nations and the uh, current set of international institutions? Well, I think the institutions we have are crucial, uh, but I also think they're going to need uh, improvement. Um, but I don't see how we get along without them. Uh, what institutions do is allow you to see international 
politics uh, in the metaphor that George Schultz, Reagan's Secretary of State used as gardening rather than real estate bargaining. And uh, Schultz pointed out that you play this for the long run. You plant seeds, you hoe, you weed, you trim, but you realize that you're going to be working with people again and again and again. And in that bargaining context where you're going to be uh, engaged over and over, reciprocity becomes more and more important. And institutions provide that framework for reciprocity. So the UN framework uh, is important, uh, but it's far from perfect. We're going to have to supplement that by uh, informal network organizations uh, in additions. Uh, take the current problems that we're having with the pandemic and the role of the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is far from perfect. But it's also true that we have starved it uh, for funds and we've starved it for authority. And rather than withdraw our support uh, as President Trump is now threatening, we should be thinking about how we strengthen it. Uh, how can you improve it? Uh, it's, it can blame the uh, WHO for the current crisis uh, is badly mistaken and if this crisis is like the 1918 pandemic, uh, flu pandemic, in which it came in various waves, and the second wave in 1918 killed more people than the first wave, we may be facing future waves of coronavirus, and we're going to need to work with China and with other countries to not only understand better uh, what happens in the early stages of a new wave, mutations and understanding the genetics of it. We're also going to need to find better ways to provide the equipment, uh, the type of uh, uh, aid to, that we need for medical workers, as well as trying to work together to develop vaccines. These are all things which uh, we should be working on, not engaging in a uh, a propaganda war about who is more at fault. Uh, frankly, the leadership of both China and the U.S. played this very badly and still are. Uh, it would be nice to imagine something like a, a, a Harry Truman type gesture in which uh, we saw the need for a Marshall Plan for a COVID fund to help poor countries to cope because right now these poor countries are not coping. And if they then become a reservoir for this virus, which then overflows northward uh, on a seasonal basis, uh, it's gonna be very bad for us. So you might think that in the same way in that you had uh, far-sighted presidents in the period after 45, who said things like, the Marshall Plan is in our interest, even though it transferred 2% of our gross domestic product, but it's also in Europe's interest. It can be win-win. We can benefit from it and they can benefit from it. Uh, imagine that you had the leadership today which said, we've got to make sure we help some of these poor countries deal with this. And uh, uh, otherwise it's not, going to it's good for us it's good for us if they're better at it it's good for them if they're better at it it's what i call learning that there's power with others as well as power over others i'm interested that henry kissinger in his recent article in the wall street journal about the effects of the pandemic called for leadership of providing something like a marshall plan for the world to deal with this Unfortunately, I don't see any of this in Washington. All I see is um, uh, competitive propaganda wars. And frankly, that's going to hurt us all in the long run. Uh, Joe, we have a couple of questions. Uh, and I'm gonna, now going to turn to questions from the audience uh, that are coming from New York. Uh, Tanya in New York asks, uh, how would you compare the response of President Obama during the Great Recession of 2008 uh, with President Trump 
uh, and the economic uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and also on COVID-19, uh, Philip in New York asks, uh, will COVID-19 promote greater cooperation among nations in the future, or will it lead to an acceleration of deglobalization? Well, on the first question of response to the economic effects in 2008, Obama uh, put that uh, as his priority. Um, and we got a, a package, a fiscal package, which helped to uh, buffer some of the worst effects of the uh, recession. Uh, many people say it could have been more, but that would have required more efforts by the Congress. And I think you can give Trump credit for uh, acting with the Congress to provide a major uh, relief and stimulus package with the CARES Act. Um, so I think both Obama and Trump acted on that dimension of the crisis, the economic dimension uh, appropriately, though we still have a long way to go. Uh, what I haven't seen though uh, is in a, a response from the Trump administration internationally, which would answer the second question. You would think, wouldn't you, that since a virus couldn't care less, what is the nationality of the human it kills, that the humans might say, maybe we should get together and work together against the virus. Unfortunately, that's not the way it's worked out. Uh, imagine that you said, or you had a leader who said, like a Roosevelt or a Truman, we're gonna to have to not spend so much time uh, slanging match with the Chinese over who did what to whom, but invite China, Europe, Japan, and the other group of 20 countries to set up an international COVID plan to try to help poor countries so that they don't become a reservoir of round for rounds two and rounds three of the pandemic. Uh, and we will join with others in the leadership of something like that. Uh, that one would think would be far-sighted leadership, which would be in our national interest and in other national interests as well. Alas, we haven't seen that. We have uh, two questions that overlap. Uh, Anna from St. Petersburg, Russia asks, how relevant is the question of ethics and moral behavior in other states' foreign policy policies? And uh, Cole in New York City asks, if amoral players on the world stage continue to gain on and potentially surpass moral players, at some point, is one not forced to re-examine the utility of ethics in foreign policy? Yes, I think uh, uh, both those questions are, are appropriate. Um, if you're locked in a situation where the other player in the game uh, is totally amoral or immoral, it's very hard not to, to uh, respond in a similar way. If you're playing the game uh, with a Hitler as your opponent, uh, as Churchill had to play the game in 1940, 41, uh, then you perhaps do what Churchill did, which was to bomb civilians in cities in Germany. Uh, that was an immoral action, uh, but it was perhaps justified by the existence of another actor, Hitler, who would not take morals seriously. So in that sense, uh, I think it does matter who the other players are. On the other hand, remember, you can have deep differences ideologically and morally with another player and still find it useful to create institutions which limit the conflict. Uh, that type of conflict with a Hitler is sometimes called a prisoner's dilemma situation, a zero sum game in which one uh, side loses, the other side gains. Robert Axelrod, the political scientist at the University of Michigan did a study in the 1980s, a computer tournament 
saying, what's the best strategy if you're locked in a prisoner's dilemma situation? And uh, what he found was that if you only play the game once, then it's basically cheat on the other guy or base, forget the moral aspects. But if you're going to play the game again and again and again, you quickly discover that the best strategy for both of you is reciprocity or what he called tit for tat. You cheat, I'll cheat. You cooperate, I'll cooperate. You cheat, I'll cheat again. You cooperate, I'll cooperate. And eventually both of us find that cooperation maximizes our gains over time. To apply that to a real world situation, um, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union had deep ideological differences, but they were able to cooperate on arms control and to avoid nuclear war. And in light of the current circumstances related to uh, uh, the pandemics, it's interesting that the United States and the Soviet Union cooperated with the WHO and within the UN framework to wipe out smallpox. Um, and um, uh, so you can get cooperation even when you have partners who have very different moral view than you have. Uh, we have a question from Charles in Connecticut. He asks, uh, which president had the most moral foreign policy in terms of consequences? Well, uh, I think it's hard. It's a hard call, but let me give the credit to uh, George H. W. Bush, Bush forty one, as we sometimes call him. Uh, Bush forty one uh, had an extraordinary opportunity at the end of the Cold War to uh, essentially gloat and to lord it over uh, Gorbachev and the Soviet Union. And indeed, there are members of his own party and commentators like William Sapphire of the New York Times who criticized Bush for, for not uh, celebrating more the fall of the Berlin Wall. Bush's comment or reply was, I'm not gonna dance on the wall. I have to negotiate with Gorbachev to end this situation and I'm not gonna embarrass him. So Bush had the emotional intelligence and maturity to realize that to get a peaceful outcome of the end of the Cold War was going to require an understanding of the other person's point of view and limitation of your own temptation to gloat. And when you look at the consequences, you had the end of the Cold War when the two countries could have blown each other up along with the rest of the world the Cold War ended peacefully, and it ended peacefully uh, with basically uh, a united Germany, it wasn't at the expense of the Germans. And uh, a lot of the credit goes to Gorbachev, but a lot of the credit goes to Bush and his uh, contextual intelligence and emotional intelligence, uh, because if we had not passed that test, uh, in that stormy time, uh, the world would again look very, very different. So I, I give high grades to George H.W. Bush. <clears throat> we have a question from Harris in uh, the United Kingdom. He asks, what role should international organizations such as the United Nations be playing in order to promote morality in the world of foreign policy? Well, I think international institutions can make it more possible to take a, a view which includes reciprocity. In other words, if the institutions are working well, then you can take issues out of the context of I win, you lose, and put them in a broader context of we all gain. Let me give the example of uh, climate change, which I think is going to be a major problem for all of us and a great moral issue for the next uh, uh, decade or more, the next president, certainly. Um, in, in 2009, the US and China 
were at lockerheads on climate change. And uh, the Copenhagen meeting of parties to uh, of the UN on climate change uh, was pretty much a failure. Uh, in the meantime, or after that, I should say, China and the US uh, negotiated uh, agreements between them. And other countries like uh, France and European countries, as well as UN officials, took the lead at setting up a framework so that in Paris at 2015, you got an agreement on the Paris Climate Accords where the US and China, who had been at, those are the two biggest uh, greenhouse gas emitters, had been at loggerheads in 2009, came out with a similar position on agreeing to a framework in 2015. That's a, that's a great example about in which the existence of institutions, as well as a willingness to negotiate, uh, can make us all better off. Alas, of course, uh, uh, President Trump called this a hoax and withdrew from the climate, uh, Paris Climate Accords. Uh, but I suspect that a next president, uh, uh, whenever that arrives, um, will rather rapidly rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. We have a question that dovetails with what you just said <clears throat> from New York City. You refer repeatedly in your book uh, to the challenges that await the 46th president of the United States. Are we to read into this that you expect the incumbent in the White House to be a one-term president? No, I, I expect there will be a 46th president, but I don't know whether it will be in 2021 or 2025. So that uh, the reason I use that term, the 46th president, was faith in the American democratic system over the long run, but uh, predicting the exact timing uh, is, uh, is beyond me. Uh, I do think, however, that uh, uh, to violate that rule, that the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic has uh, reduced President's chances, President Trump's chances of being elected, generally speaking, uh, a president, uh, an incumbent president with a strong economy has a high probability of re-election. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, the COVID crisis uh, may upset those uh, normal type predictions because it's not a normal situation. Uh, let's uh, widen the aperture here with uh, this question from Earl in New York. Who defines the moral framework? Can there be a moral framework that all nations ascribe to? Yes, there are certain moral uh, issues which nations do all ascribe to. For example, in the UN Charter, you're not allowed to use force against another country except in self-defense or if it's authorized by uh, the UN Security Council acting under Chapter 7. So uh, that's, you might say, well, isn't that obvious? Well, in the 19th century, that wasn't obvious. States reserved the right to go to war for their own advantage when they wanted. Uh, so there has been, in that sense, a moral progress uh, uh, about a basic uh, norm of uh, non-use of force. In addition to that, you have things like the UN um, uh, Charter of Human Rights which has been signed by uh, almost all countries. Now, it's true that not all countries interpret uh, human rights exactly the same way, but you'll find many areas where you do have agreement on, on norms and moral views, uh, which cross uh, uh, sovereign state lines, but also uh, which uh, uh, cross some ideological and religious lines as well. So I'm not arguing that everybody has the same morality, uh, but I am arguing that uh, uh, there is perhaps more to be built upon than we sometimes realize. And maybe we can uh, circle back to FDR. This is a question 
from David in Maryland. Do we need to do more uh, than promote the four freedoms? Freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom of worship. Well, FDR's four freedoms were a great start, but remember that was 1941 at uh, uh, the, the Atlantic uh, Charter. Um, what we have to realize is that in the 21st century, we have a new set of problems that have to be added. Uh, if you take this issue of climate change, which is a transnational issue in which the, uh, the, the greenhouse gases don't respect borders, they cross borders outside the control of governments, or if you take the issue of pandemics where viruses don't respect borders and cross borders uh, outside the control of governments. You can't solve these with tariffs or walls or, or even with domestic stimulus uh, problems. You can't solve them obviously with military responses. So there are a new set of challenges which uh, are arising uh, from basic changes in technology, the technology of transport and communication and uh, production which obey the laws of physics, not the laws of politics. And if in some ways, these dimensions of globalization, of things that cross borders at intercontinental distances, ecological globalization, uh, are not going to be hindered uh, the way that uh, economic globalization is, in other words, ecological forces are still globalizing because of technology, uh, even if the tariffs and trade wars were to set back some of the economic globalization. So we're gonna have to develop common views of how to deal with these transnational problems. And I've, I've argued there in the book that we have to realize that uh, even while you compete with other countries, uh, and in the traditional way of thinking about power over other states, these new issues are very different. You can only get leverage on them if you work with other countries. In other words, you need power with others as well as power over others. And a political leader today, a moral political leader, has to explain to his or her public that the tasks that we face, the challenges that we face, are going to require power with, as well as power over others. And we have, uh, to your last point, a question from Lizzie. She asks, has US soft power been permanently diminished uh, as a reliable partner with our allies and world power within multilateral global institutions over the past three years? Is it possible to correct course? Well, it certainly has uh, American soft power, which is the ability to affect others to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment, has certainly diminished over the last three years. Uh, you can see this in public opinion polls uh, by reputable organizations like uh, Gallup or Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, you can also see it in the index of soft power, which is called the Soft Power 30. It's published in uh, London every year. Uh, but we have gone down. There's no question about it. And frankly, the inept way in which we've handled the early stages of the corona crisis is not helping our soft power. It's, it's hurting it. Um, but I still think we're going to recover. And the reason is that a large amount of American soft power or any country's soft power comes not from the government, but from the civil society, from uh, in the American case, from Hollywood or universities or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so forth. Uh, and in that sense, I think those institutions remain strong and attractive. Um, People still may complain about the United States, but want to go to uh, a university in the United States or to read American literature or to watch an American film. Uh, perhaps the, the, the example that is most relevant here would be 
uh, the case of Vietnam and the Vietnam War. In the uh, uh, period of the early 70s, the United States was widely unpopular around the world because of the Vietnam War. Uh, people were marching in the streets around the world, uh, criticizing and protesting the American government policies. But you know, what's interesting is the protesters were not singing the Communist International. They were singing Martin Luther King's We Shall Overcome. In other words, an anthem from American civil society was being used to criticize the American government. And that's part of the source of American soft power and the strength of the United States, which is, well, the government often does uh, dumb things and has inept policies. The society is, self, is susceptible to self-correction, to self-criticism and self-correction. And uh, I think that will turn out to be true uh, after the current uh, downswing that we've seen in American soft power. And then we have the question uh, from Tony, democracy seems to be declining around the world. Uh, do you see a reversal uh, of this trend in the future? Well, we've had periods where democracy or the number of democratic countries has gone up and has gone down. Uh, so there have been cycles in democratization. I think right now you have uh, with the rise of things like Orban's uh, illiberal democracy and in Hungary, uh, you see uh, trends which are negative and uh, downward. But on the other hand, uh, let's not overdo it. Um, South Korea was able to hold a democratic election with uh, major turnout uh, in the midst of the pandemic crisis. Uh, and uh, South Korea has been relatively successful in coping with the pandemic, even though it's a democratic country. Some people have said, well, only authoritarians can deal with uh, crises, um, but that's not necessarily true. And there are countries like New Zealand or Norway and others, uh, which are demo democratic uh, polities and will stay democratic polities, uh, which are being uh, uh, quite successful in dealing with the uh, with this crisis. So yes, there are some downward trends for democracy, and I would expect that the economic uh, recession or deep recession that's going to follow uh, this pandemic crisis is going to make the conditions for democracy much more difficult in many countries. So I would not be surprised if one were to do a measure of the number of democracies five years from now, that it might be somewhat less than it is today. Uh, however, I don't expect the major democracies to depart from their current governmental systems. Uh, and I think that uh, we have to be aware that there are ups and downs in uh, waves of democracy. My colleague Samuel Huntington pointed this out when he talked about the different waves of democracy. I think that's true, and uh, but I think democracy in the long run will still turn out to be a successful form of governance. We have a question uh, about China. Uh, the subject of your book is the American century over. Uh, Ronald asks, we are being challenged by China for leadership in the world by contrasting economic leadership to moral leadership and we are not offering a counterpoint. What is the end result? Well, there are some people who believe that uh, China is overtaking the United States. And indeed, they argue that the corona crisis is going to be the tipping point in which uh, China passes the US. Uh, there's always been a great deal of exaggeration on this. It, looking at the Chinese economy, it's done very well. Uh, hundreds of millions of people have been raised out of poverty. It's still only two thirds the size of the American economy measured by exchange rates and about one quarter of the American economy in terms of per capita income. We don't know whether China is going to escape the so-called middle income trap and join the uh, club of wealthier countries. Uh, it faces a number of very real problems. First of all, it's 
growth rate has slowed way down from double digits. And this was true even before the uh, negative growth that it has in the first quarter because of the corona crisis. Uh, in addition to that, its, uh, its labor force has peaked. Demographically, it faces a major challenge, uh, which is that uh, a result of the prior one child policy. Uh, China also faces a, a number of problems related to uh, its conflicts with its territorial conflicts with its neighbors. Uh, China uh, has borders with 14 countries and has serious territorial concerns with a number of them, like Japan or uh, Vietnam or India and others. Uh, so China faces a lot of difficulties. Indeed, another one is that the Chinese uh, healthcare system, the domestic healthcare system, is inadequate. And this was exposed during the, uh, during the corona uh, crisis in Wuhan. And it's going to cost China a good chunk of GDP to try to bring that up to uh, the standards that it needs. And that, of course, will mean competition with other sources uh, of use for those revenues at a time when uh, the economy will be slowing down. So I, I don't, uh, you know, China is, is a serious competitor, uh, but it's also a country where the United States uh, has certain assets and uh, in terms of allies and, uh, uh, and location. And I think, uh, I, would, I think we've over-dramatized the China threat. And one of the hard questions for the next president will be to get a balance in a policy toward China to compete with China on issues like say the South China Sea, where China has, according to the Hague Tribunal, illegally extended its uh, jurisdiction out into uh, the open ocean. Uh, you can send naval patrols through the South China Sea at the same time that you can cooperate with China on something like uh, climate change. And the job for a president is to explain that you can have cooperation and competition simultaneously. It doesn't have to be all competition all the time. Well, on that note, uh, Joe, I'd like to thank you for being with us today. Uh, congratulations on a very stimulating and informative book. The book is Do Morals Matter? Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump published by Oxford University Press. We look forward to an in-person event with you in the near future in New York. Let me thank our audience for your participation. Until our next edition of FPA Live, this is Noel Latif signing off with our motto at FPA. An informed public is an engaged public. Stay safe and take care. Thank you, Noel.